Hi, welcome to this video on DNA replication. Now, in order to grow and to reproduce, cells need to divide. And prior to division, they need to replicate their DNA. So they need to make copies of their DNA. So a quick reminder on the structure of DNA. You should uh, be aware that DNA is made up of two strands uh, that run anti-parallel to one another. Each strand made up of a sugar phosphate backbone, so made up of phosphate groups and deoxyribose uh, sugar. And then attached to each of those is um, the bases A, T, C, and G, or cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. Each base uh, is complementary paired to uh, another base on the other strand, uh, where C pairs with G and A pairs with T. And between these bases, we have hydrogen bonds. So in order to replicate this DNA, we need to make an exact copy of it. We need to make sure that in the, uh, the second copy, that all of the bases are in the correct positions and they are also paired up with their complementary bases. So this is not an easy feat to achieve by the cell, but this is how it manages it. So it requires two enzymes, DNA helicase, shown here, and DNA polymerase, shown here. So the first thing that needs to happen for DNA replication is we need to separate these two strands. So effectively, we need to break the hydrogen bonds between these uh, two strands here. So this is the job of DNA helicase. It unwinds the DNA double helix, and then it moves along the strand and breaks the hydrogen bonds. So it breaks hydrogen bonds between complementary bases on the two strands. So now what we've done is we've exposed these bases. Next up comes DNA polymerase. Now DNA polymerase moves along one of the exposed strands. The strand it moves along is known as the template strand. And as it moves along this template strand, free floating nucleotides, these are just present in the nucleoplasm, that's the cytoplasm of the nucleus, they're just diffusing around. These free floating nucleotides are attracted to the exposed bases on this strand here. So wherever you have a, a T exposed, then a nucleotide with an A base, an adenine base, will be attracted to it. These free-floating nucleotides uh, move in, diffuse in, randomly collide with the correct uh, exposed base. And then DNA polymerase moves along the template strand and it forms new phosphodiester covalent bonds between these free-floating nucleotides. So effectively, the DNA polymerase is forming a new DNA polymer. That's where the name comes from. So it forms the phosphodiester bonds between these bases. Now, for some reason, I'm not sure why, many, many pupils always suggest that DNA polymerase forms the hydrogen bonds between these complementary bases. It does not. No enzyme is needed to form those hydrogen bonds. That occurs just by chance when the free-floating nucleotides diffuse in. DNA polymerase is responsible for forming the covalent bonds, the phosphodiester bonds between the new nucleotides. So as it moves along there, new phosphodiester bonds formed, so a new strand is formed, and you can see now that this part of the new molecule is now complete, and it looks very similar to the original, how the original molecule looked with two strands running anti-parallel with complementary base pairing between. Now, the same will have to occur on this strand down here. A different DNA uh, polymerase will be working on this strand as well at the same time, so that eventually we form two new strands. And importantly, because the new bases that have uh, diffused in and have been bonded together are complementary to the exposed bases, they should be exactly the same uh, sequence of bases as you find on the original alternate strand. So you can see here we have T, A, G, A, C, G, T, T, A, G, A, C, G, T. And so this strand here uh, will be identical to another new strand that will eventually form down here. Now we refer to this form of DNA replication as semi-conservative DNA replication. The reason for this is because in each of the new strands, so this one here and the one that will form down here, within each of those DNA molecules, we have one original strand. So this is the original parental strand that was used as the template and one new strand. 
And down here on the opposite side, we have one parental strand that will be used as the template and formed alongside here will be another new strand. So that is semi-conservative DNA replication. Now, the theory on this, uh, as with all theories, uh, wasn't necessarily always the case. One original opposing theory was the theory of conservative DNA replication. And conservative DNA replication suggested that actually we have our original DNA molecule and somehow a photocopy is made of that. So that in your, new, uh, your two DNA molecules that result from this, one of them will be entirely made of the original strands and the other would be entirely made of new strands. This theory um, was rejected and the semi-conservative DNA replication theory was suggested by two scientists called Messelson and Stahl. Now, there aren't many experiments you need to be familiar with in the course, but this is one of them. So this is the Messelson and Stahl experiment to demonstrate that DNA replicates by semi-conservative replication. Now, in order to do this, uh, they needed a few different things. They needed some E. coli bacteria. That was the uh, species that they chose to study. They needed some growth media to grow it on, and they needed actually two types of growth media. One of the types of growth media they used what's called heavy nitrogen. This is an isotope of nitrogen where there is an additional neutron in the nucleus of the nitrogen atoms. So this heavy nitrogen is known as N15. So it has a molecular mass of 15. This is opposed to the normal nitrogen that you might find in atmospheric gas, which is uh, light nitrogen or N14. So it has the normal number of neutrons in the nucleus. So the, this growth media containing N15, when the bacteria grow on this growth media, they are going to use that heavy nitrogen to build new molecules within their cells. And importantly, uh, they need nitrogen to produce the nitrogen containing bases in DNA. So any bacteria grown on this heavy nitrogen containing media are going to produce what we call heavy DNA. That is DNA that contains the heavy isotope of nitrogen in its DNA, in the nitrogenous base. Compare that to E. coli grown on the normal light nitrogen, their DNA will be lighter because it contains the light isotope of nitrogen in that nitrogenous base. The final thing they needed was a system to separate DNA based on its molecular mass, so whether it's heavy or light. And the system they used is known as ultracentrifugation or density uh, gradient ultracentrifugation. Now, this is essentially a machine that works a little bit like a washing machine in that it spins around very, very quickly. If you insert some test tubes in this machine um, and within your test tube you have a solution, when it spins around in the centrifuge, any substances, uh, molecules, particles within this solution are going to separate based on their density. So the more dense materials are going to sink further down and the lighter, less dense materials are going to remain closer to the surface of the solution. Okay, so this is the experiment they chose to run. First, they grew some E. coli on um, media containing only heavy nitrogen, and they grew it until they were sure that every cell had incorporated the heavy nitrogen into all of its DNA. They extracted the DNA from this E. coli, and they spun it in their centrifuge, and they confirmed that this is the position in the tube that they found the DNA. So this is the position that they associated with heavy DNA. Uh, this diagram over here represents that all of the DNA in this E. coli is double-stranded, and both strands are made up of heavy nitrogen-containing DNA. Now, they took some of this E. coli that they'd grown on the heavy nitrogen containing media and they now plated it out, spread it out on some media containing the lighter nitrogen. They allowed it to grow for exactly one generation. That is, the E. coli, every cell divided once. They then extracted the DNA from this E. coli and they spun it in their centrifuge and they found that all of the DNA appeared at this position in the tube here. And you can see that compared to their original sample, which was grown entirely on heavy nitrogen, you can see that the DNA is less dense. 
Now, what they suggested here, that actually, if this was a process of conservative DNA replication, they should have seen two bands in this um, second tube. They should have seen one band down here, exactly the same position as their original sample, and a second band up here. Instead, what they found is one intermediate band. They found a medium weight band or medium weight DNA in these cells. Now, what this suggested was that when these cells divided, uh, in each of the new cells, their DNA was composed of one original parental strand that contained heavy DNA and one new strand containing the lighter nitrogen, so lighter DNA. And the same is true in the second cell that was also formed. So as a result of this, this DNA is medium weight, is composed half of heavy and half of light nitrogen. And so they got this intermediate band. Had it been conservative replication, then one of the new cells would have been made entirely of the heavy nitrogen containing DNA, and you would have found a strand containing entirely lighter nitrogen containing DNA. So this is where the theory that it should have appeared one band here, heavy, and one band here, light. Well, they continued the experiment and continued to grow the, the E. coli for a second generation on the light nitrogen. So at this point, they'd grown uh, initially on the heavy nitrogen until every cell contained the heavy nitrogen, and then two generations on the lighter nitrogen. So this is generation two down here. They spun the samples in the centrifuge again, and they found that they kept one band here at this intermediate weight, and now they had a brand new band representing the lighter nitrogen containing DNA up here. So this was explained by this uh, diagram again. So generation zero, all heavy. Generation one, 50% heavy, 50% light in both molecules. And then generation two, where each of these has acted as a parental strand. Each new strand uh, that forms alongside it can only be formed of the lighter nitrogen. And so we end up with one molecule with the heavy nitrogen parental strand, light nitrogen uh, new strand and then one molecule where you've got the lighter nitrogen parental strand and lighter nitrogen um, new strand. And the same is case for the division in that second cell. So now four cells formed, half of them are the medium weight DNA and half of them are entirely lightweight DNA. And that's exactly what we find here. Repeat for a third generation and you should find that this uh, strand of DNA here acts as the parental strand and then a new strand forms alongside. This is parental and new, parental and new, parental and new. And the same is true over here. And so what we should find in the centrifuge is that we get about 25% of all DNA is this hybrid DNA of heavy and light and the remainder is entirely light. And that's exactly what they found in the centrifuge. So this band here representing the hybrid heavy light DNA and this band here representing entirely light. So just to recap, the zero generation, which is where the cells have been grown entirely on heavy nitrogen, you find a band at the point representing heavy DNA. After one generation on the light nitrogen, all the DNA that forms is the hybrid DNA with one light strand and one heavy strand. And then after the second generation, you've got 50% hybrid DNA, 50% light, and after the third generation, it's 25% and 75%. And you can see it does continue on into further generations. Okay, these are the key terms from this topic. So pause now if you want to write these down. Loads more free resources on my website, pxsbiology.com. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share if you found this video useful.